Okay, so welcome back to our uh, video classes and today we're going to talk about word and sentence stress. Okay, some basic concepts. So to begin with, in English, any syllable in a word can be, might be, the stressed syllable. Okay, so in Portuguese we have a restriction that only the three last syllables can be stressed. But in English, there isn't this restriction, okay? So any syllable might be the stressed one. Doesn't mean in a specific word you can stress any syllable in that word, but it means that just looking at a word, you, you can't know a, uh, a restriction or a limit for which syllable might be the stressed one. It might be the first, the second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on, okay? So just to illustrate here, there are three three syllable words and just to show that the first, the second or the third one might be stressed. So in the first word you pronounce it technical, not technical and not technical, but technical. First syllable is the one stressed. In the second word you pronounce it banana, so you stress the second syllable. It's not banana, not banana, but banana. And the last one you stress the final syllable. You say you, you pronounce it understand and not understand, not understand, but understand, okay? And what are the characteristics of a stressed syllable? A stressed syllable is longer, has higher pitch, and is louder than the other syllables. So you see that the characteristic of a stressed syllable has a comparative in, in the term. We don't say that the stressed syllable is long, has high pitch and is loud because a stress has to do with relative prominence. So stress, we can only talk about stress when comparing a syllable to other syllables. Okay, so the stress syllable is longer, has higher pitch and is louder than the other syllables in the word, and especially than the neighboring syllable or syllables. Okay. Now, the most common vowel in English is the schwa, and we already talked about this when we were talking about vowels. And one of the reasons is because in connected speech, all unstressed vowels can be reduced to schwa. So when we were transcribing individual words, uh, many of the unstressed uh, vowels were transcribed as schwa, but some were not. But then in connected speech, all vowels might be reduced to schwa. That's why schwa is the most frequent, most recurrent uh, vowel in English, okay? Now, there are some uh, uh, books that come up with these uh, uh, tendency, not, not, not even rules, right? I, I know it's written some rules, but I would say some tendencies, okay? Because there are many exceptions, so these are just like tendencies of the language, all right? So, for core vocabulary, many everyday two-syllable nouns and adjectives are stressed on the first syllable. Example, mother, water, paper, table, coffee, lovely, etc. Now, prefixes and suffixes, they are usually unstressed, okay? So you have quiet, uh, stressing the first syllable, you add this ly for adverb, you keep the same uh, uh, stress pattern, okay? You say quietly. You have original, uh, stressing the second syllable, you add the ly for adverb, you keep the same stress pattern, the same syllable is still stressed, originally. You have uh, effective, uh, you add this prefix, you keep having the same syllable as the stressed one, defective, okay? Now, there are some suffixes that attract stress. We're going to see them in a while. And there are some uh, suffixes that uh, change the stress syllable. An example that comes to mind is uh, the I-T-Y, ity. Uh, to make adjectives become nouns. For, so, for instance, you have electrical, electrical. You, st you stress lack, right? Electrical. You add iri at the end to make it a noun. You you change the stress to electricity. So then you, you end up stressing the third syllable and not the second anymore. Okay, so this also happens. Now, with compound words, if you have compound nouns, the first word is the one stressed, okay? So, for instance, you have the word news, paper. News is a word, paper is another word. If you put them together, it's a, th a third different word, right? It's a compound noun. So, when you put them together to create this new word, 
you stress the first one. You say newspaper. Same thing with teapot. You have the word tea, you have the word pot, you have the word teapot, which is a compound noun. You stress the first one. Okay, same thing for crossword, okay, for blackboard, uh, and, and so on. We're going to see many examples in, uh, uh, in the exercises, okay? Now, why is this important? Because when you have the compound noun, you stress the first element, the first word. When you have the, uh, the same or a similar phrase, but it's not a compound noun, but it's an adjective plus a noun, then you stress the noun, okay? For example, look at this first example on this slide. If you have uh, uh, the compound noun greenhouse, you stress the first word, greenhouse. There is the word green, there is the word house, and there is the compound noun greenhouse, which is that house made of glass to grow plants in it. So you say, I have a greenhouse in my property. Okay, it's, it's not even green, it's green because it has plants inside, but the house is made of glass, right? And then there is the greenhouse effect, okay, the, 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 that polluting effect that uh, causes uh, global uh, climate to rise, okay? Greenhouse. If you say greenhouse, if you stress house instead of green, then it's not the compound noun anymore, but it's an adjective plus a noun. It's, it means that it's a house that is green. So if you're looking at a house that is green, you say that you live in a green house. But if you have that glass thing to grow plants, you say that you have a green house. Green house versus green house. Okay? Same thing for the next example. If you say a hard drive, it's that computer uh, part. Okay? It's the, the memory of the computer, the HD. It's a hard drive. But if you had a difficult journey by car, you can say that you had a hard drive. So hard drive versus hard drive. Hard drive is a compound noun. Hard drive is an adjective plus a noun. All right. Same thing with the White House. If you say the White House, it's where uh, the president of the United States lives and works. Okay, the White House. But if you happen to live in a house that is white, you say that you live in a white house white house and not in the white house uh, if you have a pronoun plus a verb yeah as in the next example you stress the verb you say ice cream which is uh, different from the compound noun ice cream ice cream ice cream okay now there are some words uh, in english that they have dual roles and uh, uh, you can specify that in pronunciation by stressing the correct syllable okay and uh, uh, nouns when the word has the function of a noun uh, the stress is on the first syllable and when the function is that of a verb the stress is on the second syllable so some examples here you say the import and the export of a country that's the noun but the country imports and exports the verb, right? You say uh, he is a rebel, the noun, and he is going to rebel against something, the verb, okay? You say the increase, the noun, and you say to increase, the decrease, to decrease, the object, to object, the project, to project, uh, the present, to present, uh, the record, to record, okay? So here, here there is a nice pattern. The noun is stressed on the first syllable and the verb on the second when you have these dual roles in some words, okay? Uh, number five, as I said, there are some uh, uh, suffixes that attract the stress, okay? So there you have some of them, aid, ain, e, ask, s, and so on, okay? Examples, parade, abstain, interviewee, engineer, grotesque, covalesce, assess, statuette, critique, kangaroo, Japanese, herself, etc. Uh, now, uh, concerning the International Phonetic Alphabet, there are two diacritics that we use to mark the stress. We use this first diacritic uh, to mark primary stress, so the most stressed syllable in a word. And if you have a long word, uh, you might have a secondary stress, which is marked with this 
uh, second diacritic, okay? Now, thinking about secondary stress, you're, you're only going to have secondary stress in words with three or more syllables. And let me tell you why. Remember that I said in the beginning that stress has to do with relative prominence. So, if you have a stressed syllable, the syllable that is neighboring it, or the syllables that are neighboring it, are necessarily unstressed. So let me go back to some two-syllable words here, okay? So you have the import. If M is stressed, port is necessarily unstressed. And if you have the verb import, then port is stressed, M is necessarily unstressed. So because of this, because the neighboring syllable of a stressed syllable needs to be unstressed, it will never have secondary stress, okay? Now, if you, let me go back to the beginning. If you have a three-syllable word like banana, and the one in the middle is stressed, banana, the neighboring syllables need to be unstressed. So the first and the last syllables will be unstressed. So no secondary stress here, okay? You can only have secondary stress when you have a stressed syllable, then neighboring to it the unstressed syllable, and then neighboring the unstressed syllable may be a secondary stress, okay? Uh, let me show you the examples that I had here. So you have the word opportunity, okay? Opportunity. Stress syllable, definitely two, okay? Opportunity. Now, the two syllables that are neighboring it, per and ne, they are unstressed, so they cannot carry secondary stress. So then you analyze, all right, which one is more prominent, a or t, the first or the second? Opportunity, opportunity. It's the first one, so that's the first syllable, so that's the one carrying secondary stress, okay? Take the next word, telephone, and the pronunciation is telephone, yeah? Brazilians tend to uh, misplace the stress and pronounce it telephone because of uh, Portuguese, right? Telefone. But the correct uh, pronunciation is telephone. First syllable is stressed. If the first syllable is stressed, telephone, the second needs to be unstressed. So it's not going to have secondary stress. So secondary stress can only be in the final syllable, phone. Okay. Think of substitute. Substitute. Stress syllable is the first one. Okay. Substitute. So the second cannot have secondary stress. It's unstressed. So secondary stress is in the last one. Substitute. Look at this very long word, misinterpretation, misinterpretation. S stress syllable, te. So, pr and shun cannot have secondary stress, okay? They're unstressed. Secondary stress happens to be in the first syllable, misinterpretation, misinterpretation, okay? And contextualize, tex has primary stress, contextualize. So, the first syllable and the, the third one, need to be unstressed, so secondary stress can only be in the last one, contextualize, okay? Now, let's uh, expand and also cover sentence stress, because the ideas are similar, okay? If in word stress, we're thinking about the stressed syllable within a word, in sentence stress, we're going to think about the stressed word within a sentence, and if that word has more than a syllable, it's going to be the stressed syllable of that word, okay? Now, there are some, uh, I wouldn't say rules, but again, tendency or patterns, okay? Things to, uh, to pay attention to. So the first one is that content words will tend to carry the stress more than function words. So nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs will tend to carry the stress more than prepositions, pronouns, conjunctions, and articles, okay? So, in these examples, we have, uh, in some sentences, only content words, like Bob sees Betty. In some of them, we have uh, function words, like he sees her, we have two pronouns, right? Now, within the content words, we also have a hierarchy of stress, okay? So, in the first sentence, we have a noun, a verb and a noun. When you have this sequence, subject, verb, object, noun, verb, noun, the nouns will be stressed and the verb will be unstressed. So you're going to end up saying Bob sees Betty and not Bob sees Betty. It's going to be Bob sees Betty. Bob sees Betty. 
But when you change the nouns to pronouns, then you have function words, and then the verb will carry primary stress. So you're going to say, he's Caesar. He's Caesar. And, you're, and, and, and then already going to uh, a, a future topic, which is features of connected speech. This her, you can have an, an elision of the initial sound and just say er, er. He's Caesar. Okay? So no, notice the difference. Bob, Bob sees Betty. He's Caesar. Bob sees Betty. He's Caesar. Okay? Same thing with the next, word, the, the next phrases, right? We have Jen sells some apples. She sells them. And you can also uh, uh, delete the th in the beginning of them. Okay? So you have Jen sells some apples. She sells them. So sells and some will be unstressed and therefore, and therefore reduced. And in the second version, she and them will be unstressed and therefore reduced. Jen sells some apples. She sells them. Okay? In the, in the last one, you have Bill and I. I is a pronoun. Bill is a noun. So, you're going to stress Bill. Okay? You unstress the verb and, and, and the, the article and stress the noun again. Bikes. Bill and I fix the bikes. Bill and I fix the bikes. We fix them. We fix them. Okay? <clears throat> now, because of this, because of this uh, uh, way that we stress sentences, English tends to be what we call a stress-timed language. Okay? A stress-timed language is one in which we emphasize the stressed words and reduce the unstressed words, okay? So, going back to these phrases, instead of going like, Bob sees Betty, he sees her, we end up reducing the unstressed words to create this rhythm. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. So, in the first, in the first sentence, like, bum, bum, bum. Bob sees Betty, and in the second, it's, bum, bum, bum. he sees her, and we reduce what is unstressed. So, Jen sells some apples, she sells them. Bill and I fix the bikes. We fix them. Okay, this creates this uh, rhythm in English. All right. So here, uh, uh, in in these sentences in green and red, whatever is in red will carry more stress than whatever is in 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 green, and the parts that are in green will be reduced. Okay, and this gives the rhythm to pronouncing these sentences. So we end up saying they live in an old house. And within old house, house will have more stress, right? Because old is an adjective. They live in an old house. They live in a nice old house. They've been living in a delightful old house. They've been living in a delightful old cottage. They've been living in a delightful Victorian cottage. Okay, so you see how you emphasize stressed syllables, reduce unstressed syllables, which creates uh, this rhythm that is typical of English, okay? More examples with that pattern uh, noun, verb, noun. If you have this sequence, subject, verb, subject, with noun, verb, noun, you stress the nouns and uh, you reduce the verbs. And here we're uh, making the verb phrases longer. But even if they're longer, you're still going to reduce them, okay? So you, say, you, you would say the sequence as something like, the dogs eat the bones, the dogs are eating the bones, the dogs will eat the bones, the dogs would have eaten the bones. The dog shouldn't have eaten the bones. The, oh, there is an extra eat in the last one, okay? It's the dogs might have eaten the bones. And then you say, the dogs might have eaten the bones. So you see that many learners complain when they're, they're first starting to learn English that English speakers speak too fast. And the thing is, there are no there is no language that is too fast. There are fast talkers in, in every language, okay? But we cannot say that English is a fast language. One thing that might happen is that because of this extreme reduction of unstressed parts, learners might perceive sp English speakers as speaking fast because they're, they're probably not going to say in connected speech, the dogs might have eaten the bones, but the dogs might have eaten the bones. And you see, you don't have to say it fast. It's not might have eaten the bones. You don't have to, to run through it. Just make the, the appropriate reductions, okay? So it's might have eaten the bones. The dogs might have eaten the bones. I'm, I'm going from, from bottom to top, okay? So the dogs might have eaten the bones. The dogs shouldn't have eaten the bones. The dogs would have eaten the bones. The dogs will eat the bones. 
the dogs are eating the bones and the dogs eat the bones now if you replace the nouns with pronouns then the emphasis will be on the verbs and then the stress syllable of the main verb and the rest will keep being reduced okay so here in these versions you would say something like they eat them they're eating them they'll eat them they would have eaten them they shouldn't have eaten them they might have eaten them okay we also use stress to mark new unexpected information versus old expected information okay so new and unexpected information will carry emphasis and therefore stress whereas old and unexpected information will be unstressed and tend to be reduced okay so look at this these possibilities in the in the in the first sentence you have pronoun verb preposition noun so you stress the nouns and reduce the function words you end up saying i live in chicago if somebody asks where do you live the stressed word in that question will be live because it's the main information that this question is is uh, uh requiring okay so where do you live answer i live in chicago you don't stress live because live is old information it was already in the question the new part here will be the actual place chicago right so where do you live i live in chicago then if in the next question what do you do in chicago if you already know the person lives in chicago the primary stress will be do what do you do in chicago chicago will also carry some stress because it's a content word but if it's all the information the primary stress will be do what do you do in chicago and then if that's the question if that's the emphasis of the question what do you do in chicago and the answer is i live in chicago the same answer as before the emphasis will be different if the person if the person asks you what do you do in chicago the information the person is 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 trying to get is the verb of the the answer so i live in chicago okay chicago is already old information it was in the question the new thing is live what do you do in chicago i live in chicago and then if the question is who lives in chicago then you know the person wants to know who the person right and then you see even though in the answer you have a pronoun answering the question the pronoun will be stressed because now that's the new information chicago is old it's in the question so who lives in chicago the answer will be i live in chicago so you see how you might say the the, the sentence in three different ways for the first question i live in chicago for the second i live in chicago and for the third I live in Chicago okay let me give you this example here of this uh, uh, longer sentence but each time changing the stress and uh, explaining how the meaning of the sentence changes okay so in the first one if you have like a default pronunciation of the sentence I would stress drive airport Friday morning because it's the content words okay I'll drive you to the airport on Friday morning and especially morning within Friday and morning right but then you can say it stressing different words you could say I will drive you to the airport on Friday morning and if you say like this the mini is I will drive you to the airport not anybody else if you stress will you say I will drive you to the airport on Friday morning it's like it's not something I've done you know it's not something I do regularly but I will do it okay I will drive you to the airport on Friday morning if I emphasize drive, I will drive you to the airport on Friday morning. I'm saying I'm, uh, we're not going to ride a bike. We're not going to go by subway, but by car, because I will, I'll drive you to the airport on Friday morning. If I emphasize you, I will drive you to the airport Friday morning. I'm saying I'll drive you and not anybody else. I'll drive you to the airport on Friday morning. If I say, if I emphasize to the preposition, the meaning is I'll drive you to the airport Friday morning, but not back home, only to the airport. I could emphasize the article and say I'll drive you to the airport on Friday morning meaning the best airport possible I'll drive you to the airport on Friday morning it's 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 weird to say this for airport but imagine somebody say I'll take you to the restaurant this weekend it's like the best one okay if I emphasize airport I'll drive you to the airport on Friday morning it means it's it's the airport not anywhere else and if I emphasize Friday, I'll drive you to the airport on Friday morning, not on Saturday, not on Thursday, but I'll drive you to the airport on Friday morning. And finally, if I emphasize morning, the meaning is I'll drive you to the airport on Friday morning, not in the afternoon or evening, but 
on Friday morning. So you see, there are those general rules for uh, stressing certain words within a sentence, but in the end, if you need to uh, change the meaning of a sentence or make the meaning specific, you might uh, 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 emphasize any of the words, okay? Now, because unstressed words, they are reduced, we end up having some words that typically might have a full form and a weak form. And this happens to function words, okay? So prepositions, pronouns, conjunctions, articles, auxiliary verbs, determiners, and so on. They have a full form, which is probably the transcription you'll find in the, in the dictionary. And the way you say the word when it needs to be emphasized, particularly emphasized. And there is a weak form which is how you say it when it's reduced in regular uh, connected speech pronunciation. And it's, it's usually with the schwa and sometimes losing some other sounds, okay? So, for example, take the word do, okay, as an, as an auxiliary verb. You might need to emphasize this auxiliary verb as in the sentence, I do like you, right? It's, it's uh, an explicit emphasis. So, say, I do like you. Pronunciation, do. But when it's reduced, the other words are emphasized, you pronounce it with its weak form, which is the schwa, right? So where do you live? Where do you live? Where do you live? And you is also reduced there. So you don't say you, say yeah. Where do you live? Where do you live? Putting together, you can just say where do you live? Where do you live? Them, same thing, full form, them. I was talking to them, not to you. So there we have an intentional stress on the pronoun. The context requires it, okay? But if, if it's reduced, as in the second example, you just pronounce M, M. Go ahead, tell him what you told me. Tell him, tell him. Then to, yeah? Full form, to. I'll take you to the airport, but not back home. Explicit emphasis on the preposition because the context requires. But then in un in, 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 when it's unstressed, you pronounce it with its reduced, with its weak form, okay? And it's just t, t. Come on, we really need to go. We really need to go. We really need to go. It could even be with the flap, yeah, the tap. We really need to go, need to go, need to go. Okay? Look at these examples. Transcribed with the full forms and then transcribed with reductions. Okay? So the, the sentence, he could have gone, the way I pronounce it now, it's transcribed on the top line. He could have gone. It's how you're going to find the transcription of each individ individual words in the dictionary. But then in connected speech, you you emphasize uh, gone. That's that's the primary stress gone, and then the the transcription of gone doesn't change, and then the rest is reduced. You see, you have schwas in all other words, right? You end up saying he could have gone, he could have gone, he could have gone, and uh, you have a the tap there for could have, could have, could have, he could have gone. Pass her all the cookies. The way I pronounce it now, it's how it's transcribed on the first line, and it's how you find the transcription for each individual word in a dictionary. But then, uh, in connected speech, you're going to emphasize pass and cookies, okay? The, uh, uh, the, the first word, the verb, in this imperative, and then the object. The rest, so, so those two words, the transcription doesn't change, pass and cookies. But then uh, the part that is in the middle, her, all, the, it's going to get reduced to pass her all the cookies. Pass her, so her will, will be er. Then all the will become all, all. You, 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 you delete the th, okay? The interdental voice fricative. And then you just have all, all. Pass her all the cookies. Pass her all the cookies. Leave him alone full form uh, across these words. That's how you find them transcribed in dictionaries. But then in connected speech, you emphasize leave and alone. So the transcription of leave and alone is the same. But then him, you reduce it to m, m, and you end up pronouncing leave him alone, leave him alone. And finally, her sister is at the door. That's the transcription on the first line and how you find each word transcribed in the dictionary. But in connected speech, you will emphasize sister and door, the nouns, okay? The rest is all function words and they're all going to be reduced to her sister's at the door, her sister's at the door. Her will become her. Sister is at will be sister's it. 
and the will be the. Her sister's at the door. Her sister's at the door. Okay. 